The Magic Club. I'm a reporter for a newspaper in Chicago. I mostly write fluff pieces. I cover city council meetings, do rudimentary interviews with the local politicians, cover new business openings, and occasionally write feel-good human interest stories. It's all quite boring. I got my degree in journalism because I wanted to be a true investigative journalist. I found out late in the game that such journalists don't really exist anymore. Mostly, we're just megaphones for deceitful political agendas and a front for marketing gimmicks. I refuse to be part of this world. I feel like I need to take a shower every second of the day after spending so much time around such scum. I already started looking for a new career. It's a big city, and although I'm young and inexperienced, I'm a smart girl. I'll figure something out. In the meantime, I hold my nose and go to work for the paper every day to support myself until I find something less nauseating to do for a living. It was nearing the end of the week when my boss called me into my office. I wondered what kind of sleep-inducing assignment I was going to get next. To my surprise, my boss explained to me that it was a light week for news and he didn't have anything for me. But he had space for a 2,000 word article that he needed to fill. Come up with something interesting. Have some fun. Wow. For the first time since being employed by this detestable newspaper, I finally had the opportunity to do some investigative reporting. I always thought it would be fun to investigate an urban legend to try to find out its origins and how much truth there was to it. So I began scouring through Chicago's deep rabbit hole of various urban legends. One legend kept popping up that intrigued me. The Magic Club. Legend had it that there was a magic club located in the dark shadows of the city. In the early 1920s, the club was used by up-and-coming magicians to test their latest acts against a live audience. But sometime in the 1940s, the club's entertainment took a dark turn and became popular with audiences who were seeking nefarious entertainment. This involved complex magic tricks that would often go wrong, resulting in the death of the magician's assistant. By the 1960s, the tricks involving death were not accidental at all. They were expected and part of the allure. Due to the murderous nature of the Magic Club, it was forced to go underground. Figuratively speaking, of course, but perhaps even literally, for there was no evidence that the club ever truly existed. Over the years, several people have come forward saying that the legend of the Magic Club was true and that they had been in the audience and witnessed unspeakable acts of terror. One of the major aspects of the urban legend is that all of the credible witnesses who dared to step forward and claim that the Magic Club was real went missing shortly thereafter. This indicates that someone or something wants the Magic Club to stay hidden and will do whatever it takes to prolong the clandestine nature of the mysterious club. As the urban legend goes, those who seek to investigate the Magic Club's legitimacy will find their end before they find the truth. I took that as a challenge. I dove headfirst into the investigation. Most urban legends have some kernel of truth to them. It was that kernel I was after. The investigation proved more difficult than I expected. I thought for sure I'd find hordes of people who had interesting specific tidbits about the Magic Club. It was those mass of tidbits I was planning on searching through to find trends and potential facts that would lead me to the truth. But the information I was gathering was vague. Several people had heard of it, but nothing more. A few people said they knew somebody who knew somebody who was there, but didn't offer up any specifics about their experiences. Zeroing in on the location of the Magic Club was even more frustrating. The handful of people who claimed to know the whereabouts of the club were imprecise. Somewhere on the south side, somewhere on the west side, somewhere in the suburbs, somewhere in the sewer. None of it was helpful. I decided to turn my attention to magicians around the city and that's when things started to get interesting. 
I managed to line up an interview with the great Zapita, a local magician who had toured the world. He was a jolly fellow, very funny and all smiles. That is, until I brought up the magic club. That's when his smile disappeared and he cut the interview short. And by cutting the interview short, I mean he immediately stood up from the table and hurried out of the room without saying another word. I had a similar incident when I went to the office of Paul Judd, a comedian slash magician who was popular in the city. I didn't beat around the bush with him. I told him I was investigating the validity of the magic club. He stared at me coldly for a moment before holding up a hand, shaking his head, and walking away. Everyone I talked to, whether they were a magician, an employee of a magician, or even the owner of a magic shop, would instantly clam up the second I mentioned the magic club. The most famous magician in the city was known as the amazing Mr. Magic. He was an elderly gentleman who had long since retired from the magic game. I found out where he had lunch and tipped the host a few bucks to seat me near him. I waited until he was nearing the end of his meal and then went to his table. Excuse me, but aren't you the amazing Mr. Magic? He smiled. Why yes, young lady, I am. He seemed delighted that someone recognized him. I told him I was a big fan but then immediately switched the topic to the Magic Club. As with the others, his demeanor instantly changed. No. I never heard of such a place. Now please leave me alone. But I couldn't even get a second word out before the amazing Mr. Magic stood up and erupted, flipping the table over toward me. Get the hell out of here! Get away from me! I startled and instantly ran out of the restaurant away from the old man's fury. Why were all of these magic-related people so troubled by me asking about the magic club? I sat down at the counter of a small local diner and had a cup of coffee and a sandwich while I sifted through the small amounts of notes I had trying to figure out how to stretch it all into 2,000 words. That's when I heard the man a few seats down from me. Psst. I turned in his direction. He was a slender man in his 60s. He was wearing a raggedy suit and throwing down a few dollars of cash next to the crumbs on his plate. He stared forward as he spoke to me in a soft tone. It's real, you know. Excuse me? The Magic Club. I hear you've been asking around. A jolt of excitement rushed through my body. Finally, I had someone who might have some information about the elusive Magic Club. Yes, I am. Can you tell me about it? He continued to avoid contact with me looking in the opposite direction as he slid a small notebook card on the counter in my direction. With that, he got up and quickly exited the diner. Wait! He was gone before I could say another word. I reached over and picked up a note card he slid my way. Scribbled across the top was the address 1634 Racine. 11 o'clock p.m. To say I was intrigued was an understatement. I didn't hesitate to show up at the address at the allotted time. I waited outside a quiet apartment complex for 10 minutes when a large black car pulled up and the mechanical buzz of the passenger side window being rolled down filled the crisp night air. I bent down to see a man wearing a ski mask and a leather jacket in the driver's seat. There didn't appear to be anyone else in the vehicle. He spoke sharply to me. Get in. Now, this was getting fishy and I was reluctant to take it any farther. W who are you? Do you want to see the Magic Club or not? Well, yes. Then get in. I thought for a few seconds. Did I want the story this bad? Five more seconds and I leave for the Magic Club with or without you. I guess I did because I found myself rushing to get in the car with this strange man. The man drove on without saying a word. My instinct was to break the awkward atmosphere by making small talk, but the hard glare of his eyes made me feel like it was best just to keep my mouth shut. He drove for approximately 20 minutes, and I noticed that we were in a very seedy section of the city. Lots of vacant lots. 
Old furniture was strewn about, some of it being used as fuel for bonfires that were warming local winos. And there were a lot of intimidating figures lurking in the shadows of dilapidated buildings. I was getting nervous. He pulled up in front of a long since abandoned theater. The massive rusted marquee was hanging lopsided. Empty light sockets lined the marquee that still housed a few broken letters. In its heyday, the marquee must have been a magnificent sight. Now it was nothing more than a relic of a time long since past. The ski-masked driver pointed to the main entrance, which was now just a couple of darkened, partially boarded up doors. Knock on the door. The password is Abracadabra. Is this the magic club? I leave in five seconds. If you're still in the car with me, I take you back where I picked you up. Your choice. I let out a deep breath to relax my nerves. I came this far. I was going to see this through. I exited the dark vehicle and he instantly sped away, leaving me all by my lonesome outside the foreboding theater. I stood staring at the gloomy entrance for several seconds. The sound of a bottle being dropped on the pavement from a nearby alleyway motivated me to move quickly to the door and knock. I was rather shocked when a well-groomed man in a tuxedo opened the rickety door. He simply stood smiling at me as if waiting for me to speak. Oh, you want the password, don't you? If you'd like. Abracadabra. The man's smile grew. Thank you. I stepped inside the theater and I felt as though I had been transported into another time. The theater was immaculate, clean and bright with vintage decor. A bright red carpet blanketed the empty lobby. An usher dressed as though it were the 1950s motioned me toward the set of doors. The show is about to start, miss. As I approached the usher, I noticed the large poster next to the doors that presented the act for the night. It was a magician simply referred to as Orlock. The usher opened the door and I stepped into the theater, which was much more of an intimate setting than I was expecting. It couldn't have held more than 200 seats. The stage was small and crept close to the first row. Nonetheless, the place was packed, and my jaw dropped when I scanned the audience. Every magician in the world seemed to be there. Seriously, think of a magician, any magician, and they were there in the audience awaiting the arrival of Orlock. The usher led me to my seat. It was an aisle seat midway in the theater. I had only been seated for a few seconds when the house lights went down and a thudding voice came over the speakers. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the Magic Club is proud to present Orlock. The audience roared with approval as Orlock took the stage. Orlock was a tall figure dressed in black. He was bald and pale. His eyes were black and beady, and his skeletal fingers were unusually long. He wasted no time in getting to his first magic trick. His assistant, a lovely lady in a sparkling leotard, wheeled up an upright coffin with the hole where the face would be. The body of the casket had a huge heart painted over the middle of it, and there was a large hole through the center of the heart. Orlock motioned to his assistant, and she entered the coffin, after which he shut the door behind her. Her face could be seen through the opening, and she appeared nervous as Orlock placed a large stake in the hole of the heart, and then proceeded to pound the stake into the hole with a sledgehammer. The assistant let out a shriek of terror and began spitting out blood before drooping forward, her eyes still open, but lifeless. The audience erupted with applause and Orlock bowed as other assistants wheeled the coffin and supposed dead woman off the stage. I was surprised at the ovation the trick got. I mean, it wasn't really a trick at all. It was more like a special effect. And not an impressive one at that. I mean, she just spit out a bunch of fake blood. Next, Orlock's assistants pushed a clear tank filled with water onto the stage. Another attractive assistant in a swimsuit stepped up to Orlock and allowed herself to be handcuffed and her ankles chained together. 
She was then lifted in the air by a crane and lowered into the water. Upon being submerged, she immediately began to squirm as she attempted to free herself from the handcuffs and chains. I could see a genuine expression of terror come over her face as she realized she couldn't break free. Her eyes widened in fear and large bubbles escaped from her mouth as she panicked and wriggled around helplessly in the water. The disturbing scene was apparently amusing to Orlock as he let out a hearty chuckle which was shared by the giggling audience. I didn't get it. What was so funny about a woman pretending to drown? After a few minutes, the woman went limp as if dead and the audience cheered. The only impressive thing about that so-called trick was that the woman did appear to hold her breath for a long while. Most people in the same position truly would have drowned. After the water tank was removed, Orlock held a gun up in the air and yelled out, The bullet trick. The audience let loose with enthusiastic applause. Orlock pulled a volunteer out of the audience. The particular volunteer was one of the most famous magicians in the world. Orlock proceeded to pull a bullet out of the gun's chamber. Please sign the bullet. Orlock handed the bullet to the incredibly famous volunteer, who then signed it. From there, Orlock placed the bullet back into the chamber of the gun and pointed it at another beautiful female assistant who was standing across the stage. Before pulling the trigger, Orlock turned to the audience. She'll catch the bullet with her head. With that, the trigger of the gun was pulled and the loud bang reverberated through the theater as the assistant's head thrust back in an odd way before she plummeted to the floor. Again, applause from the audience. I didn't get it. I watched on as Orlock pulled out a knife, bent down next to his allegedly dead assistant, and began digging the knife deep within the woman's face. Blood was spurting everywhere, causing the audience to ooh and ah. Finally, Orlock dug his fingers into the dead woman's face and retrieved the bullet. He wiped the bullet off on his suit and then handed it to the famous magician. Is that your signed bullet? The famous magician smiled and held up the bullet. It is. The audience gave a standing ovation as Orlock bowed. Meanwhile, two people grabbed the dead assistant by the ankles and removed her from the stage. I could see the woman's face, or what was left of it, quite well. It was disgustingly mangled, and it looked so real. Too real. Orlock shouted out to the audience, Who wants to see me saw a lady in half? The audience exploded in applause, cheers, and whistles. Once they simmered down, Orlock gazed around at the empty stage. It seems I have killed all my assistants. I'll have to have a volunteer from the audience. A hush quickly fell over the audience and all of their heads turned toward me at once. These people, many of who I recognized, were staring at me so icy with such hatred. This was just getting so weird. I decided I had plenty for my story at this point and got up to run out of the magic club. But before I could stand, I felt a hand on my shoulder. I looked up to see the amazing Mr. Magic. He was smiling. Now you'll find out what the Magic Club is all about. Two ushers emerged from behind him and grabbed me. I started to scream and yell for help as they drug me to the stage. The audience found this amusing and cackled with delight. The ushers shoved me into the box. They fastened me in. My head was sticking out of one end and my feet out of the other. I peered over to Orlock, who was now holding a chainsaw. It appears I have a willing assistant. He pulled the cord on the chainsaw and it roared to life. I could see the chain on the blade spinning as Orlock positioned himself beside me. The audience was in a frenzy, standing, cheering, and chanting, saw her in half, saw her in half. I let out a panicked shriek as the chainsaw's murder blade struck the box. 
I could feel myself shaking and could smell the aroma of burning wood as sawdust spewed over the stage. As the sawdust turned into a red, thick liquid, I felt a sharp, jagged pain in my side, and my vision became distorted as I bounced around. I could feel my flesh being ripped apart and my ribs cracking. I was still alive when the chainsaw was turned off and the box I was inside was separated into two pieces, revealing my dripping innards to the audience. The last thing I saw before I died were my intestines spilling out onto the stage floor while the audience applauded.